Welcome back, pet parents. I have a very special guest today. I know I say that a lot, but truly, I mean a legend in the holistic veterinary med medicine space. And what we're going to be talking about a lot today, but as we were just talking about before I hit record, we can't emphasize enough. We can't say it too many times that to truly practice holistic medicine or even if you're at home and just taking care and doing things proactively with your animals at home to truly be holistic we have to look at the whole body the environment the surroundings the soul level like everything matters and mm -hmm. I know so many people, I've, I've actually seen a couple of different veterinarians posting recently how frustrated they're getting with the, the ideas of our current our, medical yeah. society kind of trickling in to the holistic field. Like, yes, we have all these wonderful natural things that we can do, but we're cherry picking them for, I have X going on with my dog. So what is the best stuff? Like that is not truly how we look at an animal holistically. It's not a miracle pill for everything we do. So but I don't want to take over this whole thing. I want to introduce you to Dr. Marlene Siegel. She is a true pioneer in the way, especially in veterinary medicine, we practice more holistically and i'm so thrilled to have you here thank you so much for being here would you mind introducing yourself and just letting people know a little bit about your huge history in the medical field <laughs> all right summarize in three minutes or less um so i've been practicing veterinary medicine for 40 years that's a four zero and about halfway through my career, around 15, 20 years, I had one of those life-changing experiences that I think the universe teased you up and said, okay, now we're going to shoot you out there and let you, let you do your thing. And it was a riding accident with my youngest daughter and one of my show horses. And the, the short version of the story is the horse reared in the air during a class my daughter was not told if your horse rears, just bail off because the number one cause of a rider being killed by their horse rearing is the horse falling and crushing on them. So we had a 2000 pound horse and a 50 pound child. And obviously that was not going to be pretty. So as my daughter, as the horse was in the air, my daughter was hanging from the reins. Her only thought was don't fall off because I'll lose my class. And she was literally pulling the horse over backwards. The horse, knowing where the child was, literally squatted on her left hind leg and pushed herself as hard as she could while being pulled over from her left hind leg as far as she could to the right. My daughter was falling to the left. She was kind of sliding off. When the horse hit the ground, you could not see space between the two of them. So when I jumped the railing and I was running to my daughter, I truly didn't know what I was going to find. Well, by the grace of God, Lily, the horse got up, but my daughter wasn't moving. When I got there, she opened her eyes. Are you okay? And she said, yeah, do you want to walk out? Do you want me to carry you out? And then the alligator tears came and she goes, carry me out. And so, you know, she was fine. But that was not the end of our story because at home, a couple times more, Lily had this reaction and the, the trainer thought it had something to do with um, her being afraid, like she was spooking at something. Well, the third time it happened, I was standing right next to the horse and it looked like there was a seizure going up her arm, her leg, up her neck, and it was horrific. And you could tell she couldn't control it. So I started having equine vets come out and look at her and uh, through a myriad of exploration, they said, we really don't know what's wrong with her, but we'll tell you that she's not safe to ride. She'll never be shown again. And you can put her out to a pasture or you can put her down. And it was those words of there's nothing more that can be done is what changed my trajectory in life because this horse had saved my daughter's life and it was impossible for me not to fix this horse. I was going to do that no matter what. I get a little obsessed with stuff like that. And this little story just came to mind. We were taking care of a, a little marmoset monkey for a client who the, the monkey got sick and they couldn't take care of it. So I ended up keeping the monkey for the rest of its life. But when the monkey passed away, we buried it outside of our office. So years goes by and we are now going to expand the office and we're going to have to move the plate, uh, the nameplate of the monkey 
But in my mind, I was so um, rigid <laughs> about not disturbing little Clancy. And I wasn't thinking of the fact that all we were lifting was the name plate. The monkey was still underground. But because I was so focused on not moving the monkey that I made them literally change the entire elevation of the next piece of property cost me thousands of dollars just so Clancy's little grave didn't get moved. And then I say that because, you know, when you're in the middle of something, sometimes you're not realistic about what your choices are. So that gives you a little stage to where my mind goes. So when they said there's nothing more you could do for this horse, oh, that's all I needed to hear, which was going to make them wrong. I, I was absolutely going to find answers. And so for the next what, 20 something years of my career, I was seeking answers where sometimes they didn't even exist. And I couldn't find them in the veterinary world because back then we really didn't know what integrative medicine was in large animals for sure. <clears throat> so I just kept looking into fun functional medicine and the, and that was young, even functional medicine back then was actually very cutting edge on the human side. So we're talking I did not have a lot of mentors to pick from and any little piece of information I got, <clears throat> I had to learn how to use it, extrapolate it, and then put it into action. So you talk about a pioneer. I really did have to start from ground zero and work my way up. Yeah. Can you just explain briefly for people, because I think we can get kind of sometimes lost in labels and we, we kind of overlap a lot of things. Can you tell me the difference in um, a holistic approach and integrative approach and functional medicine? So they are very similar. Like we also have the term bioregulatory medicine, and they're all referring to the fact that we're focused on finding the root cause of dis-ease and then fixing the root cause of disease, as opposed to in our Western or allopathic world, we are used to symptom suppression. So we name it, we blame it, and then we come up with a pharmaceutical or a surgery or chemo or radiation. But we don't, we don't go any further to identify what, what actually caused it. And then once you understand the biochemistry of it or the bioregulatory medicine portion of it, then you start understanding where did things go wrong and how can I intercede to put things back on path? Because to tell you the truth, we don't cure anything. <laughs> like we, we like to think that we aided, but we don't cure anything. It's the body that actually has to heal. That is a very important paradigm shift that I think more yeah. people are starting to to awaken to which is wonderful um but we have even myself so when i was in my early 20s i was very much in the western mindset of okay i'm going to i'm going to eat whatever i want because i didn't grow up any differently right like i'm going to eat whatever i want that tastes good that drink you know that soda whatever and anything that goes wrong give me a pill for it like yeah. that's how I grew up, so that's what I thought for a really long time. And then I started to realize that everything I do, everything I put in or on my body, the thoughts I think, everything affects the outcome. So my health, my, uh, my appearance, my, like how I feel, the thoughts, like when I am intentional about changing my thoughts to something more positive than more positive thoughts come along. And it really has been for me, like, not just enlightening, but empowering. And that's kind of the word that I'd like to use with pet parents is like, you like you are going to feel so incredible when you empower yourself with more information. And with we're going to talk a little bit more about tools and your toolkit. Because um, I know, especially, it's really, really hard on social media these days. Yeah, um, yeah. Lord have mercy. I, you know, especially with our, we have, we give so much, and, and don't get me wrong, I absolutely love our veterinarians. Even our, you know, Western trained, Western mindset veteran, like for what they are trained to do, they are excellent at it. Yeah. But we overutilize them. But we utilize them for things they aren't trained to do. And they could get more training, but, you know, that's a whole other story. And 
so there's just so much clashing of information online that it can be really hard for pet parents. But putting this knowledge out there, putting this information out there, letting people know that there are more tools that can be used. You don't, like you just said, you don't have to accept it's this or this for your pet. It's, it's deal with, you know, manage symptoms or put them to sleep. Like that, you don't have to accept that. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of these different tools in your toolbox that you have. And I know you um, help educate both pet parents and veterinarians uh, to, to utilize these tools as well, which we can talk about later. But when we think about going into the veterinarian's office and getting a diagnosis, right? It's always this prescription food and this pill <laughs> or this surgery. <laughs> and we don't have to accept that. So tell me a little bit about some of the, and I know you have many of them, but about some of these tools that you have that you're passionate about teaching others about. Well, let's put it in context because I think that's where the real value is. So I'm going to teach you my six steps to health and well-being or six steps to healing, depending on where you are in your little journey. But step number one is we have to stop doing the things that are causing the disease. I mean, that is so basic, and yet we don't think that way. So if you're feeding your animal, as an example, a processed food diet, that is what we call a species inappropriate diet. You wouldn't put high test gasoline in a car that needs regular. You wouldn't put regular gas in a car that needs diesel, right? You if you buy a vehicle and they tell you what gas to use, you typically use that gas because that's what it was designed to run on. Because we have become a society of fast, cheap, and convenient, we have taken the waste products from human processing and turned them into pet food or worse, because there's a lot of rendered foods and a lot of toxins. But no matter what the argument is, nobody should be eating processed foods. No human should eat processed foods. No animals should eat them. And processed means that they're cooked at very high temperatures. It destroys the natural enzymes and nutrition that's in the food. You can't make that up by adding in synthetic vitamins and minerals afterwards. And they're full of hormones and chemicals and genetically modified ingredients and all of these toxins that are in our food. And of course, the products that they use to stabilize it and make it last longer so it lasts on the shelf for 25 years. These are all horrible for the body. So when we talk about stop doing the things that are causing disease, we look at the food, we look at the water that they're drinking, we look at the environment, what's touching the skin, what are they breathing, what's the air quality, what's the electromagnetic frequency pollution that they're exposed to, and what is the toxic thoughts that they're exposed to? Because when we, the pet parent, are living in a state of fear or high stress or high sympathetic tone, and there's danger all around us, and we just were yelling at the kids and we're upset about our credit cards and we hate our job, and you know, all these things that the average American is feeling, we're actually creating neurochemicals. We're creating these in our body as a response to our thoughts and, and our, our response to our environment. And our pets are in training to that. So, not to make anybody feel guilty, but we do need to get a check on, are, is your glass half empty or is it half full? Are you dealing with your stress in a positive way or are you a victim to your stress? Because all of that is going to affect your pet. So that's all step number one, <laughs> you know, food, water, environment, what you're breathing, what's touching the skin and what your pet parent is thinking. Because those are all really an electromagnetic frequency, super, super important to stop and take a look at that. So it's not even a cost. It's really a choice of what you're making. Are you feeding something that is more species appropriate and healthy? Are you have a good source of structured filtered water? This is just becoming aware. And I, and I love your empowered pet because our course is called the empowered pet parent. And I named it over 15 years ago. So how funny is that? You know, I like, I, I had that premonition that that was going to yeah. be important. So it is the empowered pet parent course. Um, okay. So that's step number one. Step number two is we have to heal the leaky gut. And for those people who don't know what leaky gut is, ton of information on my website. Number three is we have to provide all of the essential nutrients that the body needs to do its job. Now, an essential nutrient are those nutrients that the body cannot manufacture 
in sufficient quantities on its own. These are nutrients that we have to eat in our diet. Well, I don't think anybody would question the fact that our soils in the past hundred years have become nutrient depleted. So the food that we're eating that's grown on those soils is nutrient depleted. Mm -hmm. And then if we're, if our animals are grazing on those pastures, if they even get outside, then they're going to be nutrient depleted. So whatever we're feeding our animals or feeding ourselves, if that food source has not been grown on mineral rich, uh, regenerative farming type of practices, they're going to be deficient. So mm -hmm. for those essential nutrients, we make sure that we provide that in a plant-based organic form so that we can dose based on body weight and functional need. And then, um, and then we look at detoxification of the six organs of elimination. And this is really important. I mean, they're all important. Okay. They're each one has its own space and you can't really skip over one to go to another because you're missing a huge portion of the picture, the holistic look at the body is all of these pieces coming together. So we have six organs of elimination, the kidney, the colon, the lungs, the liver, the skin, and then I call lymphatics and fascia together because the lymphatics run through the fascia. So those are very critical for our bodies to be able to function. And a majority of the animals that we test liver function, their liver function is almost non-existent. It's really low numbers. Now, we all know a high number means damage, a lot of cells dying or being turned over, and veterinarians are trained to look for high numbers, but they're not trained to look for low numbers. So imagine an engine that's barely able to move. It's like struggling, little guys trying to move somewhere. And that's the liver who is in charge of hundreds of detoxification jobs and production of nutrients. I mean, there's so much that the liver does. And if those numbers are really low, it means that the cells are not being turned over in a healthy enough manner to indicate that it's actually working. So we need to be able to measure an adequate amount of turnover in those cells to know that the liver is actually doing its job. So. That's really important. And then number five is the mitochondria. We make sure that the mitochondria are healthy. Those are the powerhouses of the cell. That's where we actually generate the energy. But they're also responsible for communication. The mitochondria are responsible for communication between themselves and the microbiome of the body. So all those organisms that live in and on us, they communicate back and forth. And they're telling each other what to turn on, what to turn off based on signals that are being read through hormones and chemicals and you know, our perceptions. So hugely important that we're able to uh, have all of that communication and the energy production. And then number six is clearing trapped emotions. And with all dis-ease, there are always trapped emotions associated with those dis-ease processes. Okay, so before you go any further, I have so many questions. Uh, okay. One, <laughs> is there, so every animal is an individual. Is there a specific order in which you like to do these? Or does it just depend on what is going on with that animal? Because I, I hear a lot like, okay, this animal maybe is so sick no. that we One can't. Percent. We can't, we always. can't detox. Okay. So no, you're going in that order. Always. Yeah. Always. You cannot begin to uh, treat abnormal cells until that animal can detox, but they can't detox till you quit doing the things that are causing the problem. So it okay. really is a very logical. First thing we have to do is clean up what we're doing. Yeah. Then we heal the leaky gut. Then we make sure all the essential nutrients are there because those essential nutrients are what drive our metabolic pathways. So vitamin D is not just a luxury item. It literally, vitamin D and magnesium are required to run our innate immune system. So this is not whimsical. These are biochemical pathways that need certain things in order to function. And if they don't have those essential nutrients, then they can't do their job. And the reason why we don't just drop over dead because we're missing them is because we are built to survive. That means that our body can adapt for a period of time until circumstances improve. 
But that's the crux of the matter. It's expecting circumstances to improve. But if the average person is just toddling along in life and they're not perceiving that those early warning signs are trying to catch their attention so that they do something differently, then by the time it does smack you upside the head, you're dealing with a very severe, oh, maybe not fixable chronic degenerative disease that could have been prevented had you done something different way early on. Yeah. So we don't skip any steps. Okay. So yeah. the detox one was the one I was really honed in on because I think so many people are like, you know, everything is cyclical in our like uh, social world. And um, we have these like things that we fixate on and they, they kind of come in and go out. And for some reason right now, everybody's like detox, detox, detox. And I'm like, you're not there yet. But you know, <laughs> like we <laughs> Yeah. I've got to be healthy enough to detox. <laughs> well, and I think that goes back to that whole allopathic mindset where we want to grab the next shiny object because yeah. it looks like it may be the answer. I know I've a friend of mine whose dog has cancer and she's an influencer on the social media front. And so all these people are coming out of the word work telling her how their multi-level marketing product cures everything. And, and it's that, you know, it, that's not what it's about. It's, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of effective products and tools out there and mine are not the only ones that we need to use. However, I've gotten good at using them and they all have a very specific purpose. It's not throwing spaghetti on the wall and going, mm -hmm. oh, I heard turmeric was good for everything. So let me just throw turmeric on the board. It's, mm -hmm. it's a process of understanding what is it that the body is deficient in? What is it that the body is toxic in? Why are the mitochondria not working? And then how can I fix all that? So we test, don't guess. <laughs> that's a that's my motto is you have to know what you're dealing with. And you can't look at somebody and say, oh, wow, you have mercury poisoning or you have lead poisoning. You can't see that. You have to literally test to find out where that particular animal is. And I've done probably now over a thousand cases in the last five years. And in all of the cases we've done, over 90% of our cases have heavy metal toxicosis with three or more heavy metals. Yeah. And no one's testing. So they're trying to make these animals better, but they can't get better till you get rid of the metals that are screwing up the process. So it's, you know, these are the principles that are extremely important. So that step about making sure we have all the essential nutrients, well, we test to find out what they're deficient in. And then we specifically are able to supplement them. Now, some things are a no brainer. We know that the vitamins and minerals in our food are just going to be insufficient. And so we have to go ahead and you, you, so you give them a, a multivitamin, like we have a vitamin mineral mixture that we use that supplies them with all the essential ones. And I'm, I'm emphasizing essential because the body makes all the rest of all the ones that it needs. So my focus is only providing the body with the things I know it has to have and it can do the rest. Does that make sense? It does. And I'm glad you brought up the heavy metals because that's kind of where our that's where my head has been a lot lately um, because so many people online are, and I, I, I do too, because it, it kind of hooks people in, but we are all talking about food sensitivities and leaky gut. And yes, that is a problem, but the heavy metals are totally being overlooked. And outside of you, Dr. Katie Woodley, I think is the only other one I know of right now that's talking about it. Mm -hmm. And it is real. It's, it's a really important step to to find out like where are we because like you just said so many of these animals do have really high levels of multiple heavy metals and yeah you're just not going to be able to like we can get you so far but if we're not addressing everything if we're not if something mm -hmm. that important <laughs> we're not going to get we're yeah. not going to get too far yeah um, another yeah. one is vitamin D because I, I already brought it up and the average person, even in the medical field, is not aware of the fact that carnivores, our dogs and cats, do not process vitamin D from the sun right. at all. Yeah. So they have to get it from their meat source. Well, if their meat source came from a feedlot that never saw the sun, 
then that animal that they're eating was vitamin D deficient. So, uh, so herbivores process vitamin D into their tissue, into their muscle from the sun. They actually do that conversion. Carnivores, our dogs and cats, only get it from their protein source. We as humans get it from both. So we can get it from our diet and we can get it from the sun. Well, a study was done at one of the universities and they found that 85% of dogs and cats being fed processed food were vitamin D deficient. And again, that's such an important nutrient for running so many metabolic pathways can you imagine? So I test on all of our animals that come in with a challenge. So I recently had two cases. One was a dog that was limping, that was four months old. And the other was a dog that was about a year of age that had a rash. And fortunately, very astute parents, and they wanted to test. The dog with the rash, who was just a year of age, was deficient in almost every nutrient that we tested for severely, uh. and vitamin D and magnesium and horrific. And she had osteoarthritis markers already at a year of age. The other dog that was four months was also highly deficient and highly toxic in heavy metals. So can you imagine if no one had tested either one of those animals at that age, they would have gone on to have a history of chronic skin disease, chronic allergies, chronic mm -hmm. uh, musculoskeletal problems, and never addressed the root cause of the problem. So we're yeah. really missing the boat severely. We have to test more. And it's just, these are not the tests that the standard veterinarian graduates college understanding. They're not taught that in vet school. So they really need to reach out into a more integrative world. So I, I highly encourage veterinarians to take our course that we have that. It's a 34-hour course which teaches them the basics of diagnostics and diet, digestion, gut health, and then detoxification so that they can start taking these measures and employing that and educating their, their pet parents because otherwise we're never really going to get very far. And then they end up getting so frustrated and they go, I'm so sorry, there's nothing more I can do. And you said in the very beginning, all veterinarians are amazing people. I, I, truly am telling you that I've never met a veterinarian who intentionally goes into this field to harm animals. It just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But we have also the highest rate of suicide of any industry. And it's because we have so much compassion and that compassion fatigue translates into when they have to tell somebody that their pet either died or is going to die and they truly don't, they don't know that there's anything else that they can do. And then people turn around and do the blame and the shame. And then the one star reviews these days. And, you know, they really, they try to take all of their anger and frustration and put it onto their veterinarian. And that's, it's a serious problem because these people have such compassion and such mm -hmm. kindness and it's crushing when somebody does that. So I'm encouraged that with our industry, the more veterinarians that we can reach, that we can expand their toolkit, they can have more things to offer. And I'm, I'm going to say this very clearly, none of us are going to live forever. We all have an exit strategy. We don't know what that one is. We don't know when, how, or where. Our pets are all going to leave one day. But our job on this planet is can we live the healthiest, longest life possible with thriving and vibrance and joy and gratitude and be able to contribute in a way that leaves this, I call it a hologram, that leaves our little holographic world better than the way we found it. And our pets play such a huge role in helping us to see, to have that conscious awareness and to be able to model after them what unconditional love actually looks like. So that's a whole different mindset. You know, when we, we're not trying to live forever, but we are supposed to live a healthier, longer, more vibrant life. I'm trying to remember what they, so doc, Dr. Karen Becker and Rodney Habib, they call it, it's not the lifespan, it's the um, quality of life. Quality, yeah, it's the quality of life. Like they should be healthy and happy and then dead. Like <laughs> it's not this slow decline, right? Like that's not the yeah. goal. Well, we've been taught that aging is a disease. Aging is not a disease. I am approaching my 70th birthday and 
I am not willing to age ungracefully. I'm going to get older and that's great because I have more knowledge and wisdom, but I have more vibrance, more mind clear thoughts. I can accomplish more. I'm using all those years of wisdom and I'm applying them. And I just live every day with such joy and gratitude and vibrance. And I, I look around at a lot of my friends that are 10 years younger than me and they are aging. They're telomeres are getting short and you can just see it. They don't have energy. They, they are foggy thinking and they just don't feel good. Thank yeah. God I am not willing to do that. And I, I walk with talk, you know, so that mm -hmm. way when, when I meet people and I'm asking them to make these lifestyle changes for their pet and ultimately for themselves, it's not hard. I'm a living example. It's a choice. We can choose to grow old and decrepit. We can choose to damage our body, but our pets don't get to choose that. So we really have a fiduciary responsibility. We have a moral and ethical responsibility to help these animals live their best life. And that means that we have to go away from the old paradigm shift of fast, cheap, and convenient. And if we're going to enjoy our lives with our soul babies, then we need to care for them in the way that they need to be cared for so that they can live their best life as well. I would never have imagined you were at that age. You look incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, you know, I, I, I laugh because I just came back from Brazil. I spoke at the sixth international ozone symposium. And I think there may have been one person there that was older than me, but that was it. <laughs> These were all young people. And, and you know, we, we would go out and we would go to the beach and we did some activities. And they just kept saying, where do you bottle all this energy? Where do you get all that joy from? And, <laughs> and I laugh because here they are. They're half my age. And they're like whining and complaining. And yes. no, it's, it's, it's like truly, it's how you set your mind. It's your attitude and, and how you choose to travel through Earth School. Hmm. So, okay, there are, there are lots of tests that are potentially missing, a lot of diagnostics that are potentially missing mm -hmm. in a lot of Western veterinary medicine, yeah. um, which you were, just, you were just talking about. But on, on the other end of that, there are also a lot of uh, treatment modalities that are missing, and yes. you teach about those as well. Can mm -hmm. and I I know we we can't go too into detail on all of them because I'm sure there are a ton, but there are some. So I we we actually I got to meet you at AHVMA because I had Jonathan Lau on the podcast talking about ozone. So I know ozone is one of those modalities, one of those tools in your toolbox. Um, but there are others that I think most pet parents have no idea even exist. And some, I, probably a lot of veterinarians don't even know exists. And they have been really wonderful for you. And as you said, you use them very strategically for various things. Can you tell me a little bit about just some of those to kind of give pet parents an idea of like, this isn't just theory, like there are actual things out there that can help that we don't know about. <laughs> no, absolutely. So the very first thing that we start with, if I may unpack it a little more succinctly, is we start with getting in a parasympathetic state. So let me explain that. We have an autonomic nervous system. And there are two branches of the autonomic nervous system, a sympathetic and a parasympathetic. And they work in opposites of each other. So when one is turned on, like a teeter-totter, the other one is turned off. Let me see my hands. Okay, one is up, the other one is down, and then yeah. you switch, right? And there, there is an equilibrium in there where there's a time where maybe it's balanced. But for the most part, our sympathetic side is the side that kicks in when there's danger. It's our survival mode. It's when the saber-toothed tiger is about to catch you and you have to mm -hmm. run for your life or turn around and bop him in the nose or whatever you're going to do to save your life, but you are in imminent danger of being killed. And then your parasympathetic side is the rest, repair, digest, and detoxify and reproduction. Um, that's that side. And it makes sense because if you're running for your life, 
You really don't care if you're hungry. You won't remember that. You're not worried about who you're going to have sex with that night. And you're not worried about going to the bathroom because you probably just pottied in your pants if you had to go. So I, I say it in that kind of a context because that's how serious it is, right? When you're in high sympathetic drive, that's you're just being driven for survival. Now, in today's day and age, we don't have saber-toothed tigers chasing us, but we have the stress of our kids, our jobs, our finances, credit cards, processed foods, toxins, EMF. We have all this other stuff. And of course, the news. Turn off the news, guys. You don't really need to know the news. So all of this is keeping us in high sympathetic tone. And then when you're in high sympathetic tone, you literally are turning off your parasympathetic side, which is this side that has to be used in order to heal and repair. So the very first thing that we do is get our patients in a parasympathetic state. And we have some technologies, we have machines that we put the people and their pets in, which through frequency activates the parasympathetic frequencies so that you start to relax. And our pets fall asleep in there. Pet parents immediately start to relax. They come out and they go, I haven't felt what that feels like in so long. And they don't even quite understand what they just experienced, but we've just entrained them into being relaxed into a parasympathetic state. I've got a picture of one of my colleagues sound asleep inside this machine uh, in a chair at a uh, the North American Veterinary Conference, which is the, you know, 16,000 veterinarians. The conference hall is absolute chaos. She's sound asleep in the chair because it just put her in a parasympathetic state. Sign, sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> and these and these units are available for home use. So almost everything I'm describing can be used by a pet parent at home. Now, do you want to, some pieces of equipment are kind of expensive and some are not, but we're opening detox, I, yeah, we, I am opening detox centers for pets and their parents to be able to utilize these technologies. So for somebody who either doesn't have the space or the financial means to be able to buy all these things, you can still be a part of it by going to one of the spa centers. So hopefully they're open next year. All right. So that's first thing we do is we end up in a parasympathetic state. And then we want to be able to help the lymphatic system start to move. So we have a variety of different techniques that we utilize to help support lymphatic drainage and movement. And then the fascia. Now the fascia course is real interesting because that is all done by the pet parent. If we have to, we'll, we'll do it like the first treatment and we will do that in the office. But then our pet parents actually take the course online and they learn how to use just their hands and gravity to be able to release the it's called fascia decompression. So that's a really cool thing that's on our website. I would highly encourage every pet parent should be doing that with their pet every evening. You know, there's, you don't have to do the whole course, but you, you do pieces of the course depending on what your pet needs. So we've got the lymphatic, we've got the fascia, and then we do a ion foot bath because we've now stirred everything up. We want to pull those toxins out. We have a salt room, which is literally a, it's called a halo generator. So it micronizes medical grade salt into this really fine dust. And what that's doing is you're breathing it in through your nose and or your mouth because with our pets, we'll close their mouth so that they're breathing through their nose. And it's like a scrub brush, a toothbrush along the respiratory system. So it's, you know, just imagine all that mucus and gunk that gets clogged on all of those mucus membranes. And so this helps to, the salt helps to pull all that mucus and then you either sneeze it out or cough it out. It's also great for the skin because the salt is also antiviral, antifungal, and antibacterial. Mm -hmm. So their skin is also being treated at the same time. And then we have um, ozone, of course. Ozone, we utilize in so many different ways. Every orifice, topical, intravenous, um, injectable in the abdomen. Ozone is amazing when it's used in conjunction with the other toolkit. And then we have hyperbaric oxygen, which of course is all about increasing the amount of oxygen that's reaching the tissue. So that's the whole goal is to get oxygen released to the tissues. And 
for most people, they breathe just through their chest. They have forgotten how to do belly breathing. So if you are one of those people and you just became aware of the fact that your belly isn't moving when you're breathing, mm -hmm. then you need to start taking some classes on how to do proper breathing techniques. And for our pets, they will also start holding their breath when they feel that high sympathetic drive because you're in high sympathetic drive. So we want to get them doing better breathing and then taking that oxygen and pushing it out to the tissues. The thing with hyperbaric oxygen, it's not a one-time treatment. It's a cumulative treatment. So it takes almost four days for the body that's already been oxygen deprived to realize that, oh, I have enough oxygen. I can go ahead and share out to my muscles. But for the average individual... It, it takes a couple of days for the body to really feel comfortable releasing that extra oxygen. So that's an amazing technology. And now they've got chambers that are, in my opinion, are affordable because our solid chambers are 150,000 and up and they can explode and you have to have a lot of care and you have to have pumped in oxygen and a lot of, a lot of things happen with that. But with these soft-sided chambers, they're under $10,000. You just plug them into the wall. They don't require anything special. You can operate it by yourself. You can actually turn it on, get in, zipper it up, and then take yourself out. You don't have to have somebody on the outside. And it really takes you to 1.3 atmospheres, which is enough to accomplish most of what we need to accomplish in medicine. Mm -hmm. well, we have infrared therapy. Um, is fabulous. And we use full spectrum infrared, not just the argument is near better, is far better, is mid better. Well, you know what? The sun produces them all. And I am a big fan of nature. So if nature uses it all, then it makes sense that we were probably designed to use it all. So I use full spectrum infrared. And then, uh, then we get into some of the other things that are a little beyond the scope of what a pet parent would do, but that is either low level light therapy, which is using the colors of the rainbow, mostly the visible rainbow, but we also use ultraviolet and infrared, which are outside the visible light spectrum. And we use it therapeutically. So each of those colors has a different effect on metabolic pathways. So as an example, red light is the um, infrared light is what is used to stimulate the mitochondria, the little energy packets to actually produce energy, ATP. So if you lived in the dark all the time and you were never exposed to light, you would quickly not be healthy. So these are really important concepts to understand that we were designed to actually utilize these lights. And then photodynamic therapy is where we use light in conjunction with a photo activator, always a natural compound. And that makes that natural compound way more effective. And so it's actually used to kill cancer tissue and um, help to get rid of abnormal cells. Mm. <laughs> oh, there's so much. <laughs> oh, here's more. But that, you know, yeah. I think that was enough for now. And yeah. what, I, what I hope that the pet parent gets from that is that there really are a lot of things that you can utilize, but you don't build a house from the roof down. You build it from the ground up. So your foundation needs to be solid. That's step number one. Stop doing the things that are causing the problem. And if you don't know what that is, we have a free PDF that you can download and it goes over all of that stuff. So you don't have to be left in the dark. And then you have to work on the gut health and then you have to make sure all the essential nutrients are there. And then you start picking your tools for detoxification. And that's where all these things that we just talked about, that's where they come in. But if you just think ozone is going to be the answer to all your woes, it's not going to be the answer to your woes. In fact, there's not a lecture I haven't given to veterinarians where somebody doesn't come up to me and goes, I don't understand. I use ozone and I'm not getting the results that you're getting because they're still feeding toxic food. They're still not paying attention to the environment, to the metabolic pathways. They're not setting the body up for success. One thing that I keep hearing you talk about, and I'd, I'd like to just really point it out, is the effect that we, as the pet parent, 
our stress, our emotions, our behaviors, our thoughts, our actions are having on our pets. Yeah. And it seems to be like through every single thing you've talked about, it is our pets are picking picking all of these things up from us. So as as part of that program, it's not just cleaning up everything for your pet. We we really have to clean everything up for ourselves in the same at the same time. The same process has have to be going on to clean yeah. these things up for ourselves, to clean up our bad habits, how bad we're treating ourselves, the bad thoughts we're having, because yeah. they are affecting our pets in ways so many of us never think of. And mm. I I really I have I I have told so many people this, so many like um, pet parents and clients that I'm like, I mean, I, I, I hate to say this to you, but you're part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad you said it that way because, you know, one of my big things is own it, right? Yeah. If, if you thought it or you're experiencing something, you created it. And, and that's not meant to make anybody feel bad or to right. make them feel guilty or shamed. It's just a simple fact. We choose how we experience things. We can choose to experience a something that the average person would say be negative and we could be a victim to it, or we can choose to look at that situation and the in as we own it and say, what was I thinking? Or what's the blessing that this experience will bring to me? And Trust me, I know those ouchy times, it's not easy to do that when you're in the middle of the ouch, but just, we all know that we've looked back on moments that we thought were horrible and we look back and we go, what a blessing that turned out to be. Cause if that didn't happen, then this wouldn't have happened. And, and so as we look back, we see the beauty of how the universe does truly guide us. We still have to make choices when we're there. We're not just bouncing around the luge and going down without any steering, we we do have the ability to look at our circumstances and choose to learn from it or be a victim from it. And so I think our pets, for me at least, are part of the vehicle that helps us to become more conscious. And as we take ownership of our choices and the choices that we've made, and we take ownership of the things that we're doing to them, we're also doing it to Mother Earth. So we know we can't separate, just like we can't separate our organs from our body, we can't separate us from Mother Earth. This is the planet that we live on. And so as we make more conscious decisions about how to be healthier for ourselves, for our family, for our four-legged family, we're also making a huge impact on Mother Earth because we're saying no to the things that are causing damage all the way around. You also said uh, about light therapy that we want to utilize it the way nature is giving it to us. Mm -hmm. And um, so to bring nature back into this, because that that is my big thing as well, like nature provides. So I always try to tell people to take a step back and think, okay, in nature, what would we do? How would this be? But But you have a very special piece, piece of nature that you live on. <laughs> and I am fascinated by it. And would like, these are goal. These, these are like goals for people to have is to live on a piece of property like you have. So can you tell me a little bit about your yarden as you call it? <laughs> yeah. So I've always been passionate about growing food. Even when I was in undergraduate college, I would pay a local farmer to till my land and I was out there planting corn and peanuts and vegetables and such. So I've always enjoyed doing that. And that didn't come from anybody in my family. <laughs> I was definitely rogue when I began that one. And then when I bought this piece of property, it's just a third of an acre, but I've turned it literally into a food forest. So every year, just I would buy a couple new plants, um, use a lot of our, our horse for our horse poo comes out as our fertilizer, a lot of mulching. I do pretty much regenerative agriculture, permaculture, um, just had a TV station come out and do a story on the yard in, which was really cool. And it's all about 
it, it all just comes back to being empowered. You know, it's not about, oh, I'm saving tons of money by growing my food. Probably not because I put a ton of money into growing my food. But I just had my photographer was out this morning and he was taking drone pictures so we can map all the different trees and the raised beds and what's in them so I can make my rotations. And he, I gave him a little cherry tomato that was so beautifully ripened on the vine still. And I put a little piece of basil with it and he just ate it. And he looked at me and he said, I've never eaten anything so delicious. A little mm -hmm. cherry tomato and a piece of basil. It's amazing. But what I get out of it besides, of course, I love the food. But what I get out of it is the joy, the gratitude, the connection to the earth, the grounding, the microbiome. So every time I pull a weed, there are hundreds of thousands of microbes that I am aerosolizing and I'm breathing them. They're on my skin. And I come in at, at the end of a day and I just feel so gratified. I feel so good. Any tension that I had, any frustration that I might have had, it's gone. You're out there sweating and detoxing and enjoying I'm literally sitting on the ground or digging in the dirt and then eating things that I just, we eat a lot of our weeds. We eat a lot of our plants. And so you're just out there constantly connected to nature in a way that if you haven't done it before, you really need to start somewhere. And all of that, all that plant material is all structured, by the way. So the water in that plant material is structured because it's done through the ultraviolet light from the sun. Mm -hmm. So, so now when I'm eating those plants, I am structuring the water in my body by virtue of what I'm eating out of the garden. So all very intentional. And then something as simple as, you know, how all religions, they talk about saying a prayer before meals and sometimes you know, after meals as well. Mm -hmm. And what that does, it puts you in a parasympathetic mindset. Because you can't be thinking of running from danger when you're giving gratitude and such joy and love to something that you are about to partake in. So it actually calms you down. It helps to get your digestion ready to intake food. And then your presence. So many people are not present in the moment, but they're on a quantum level. There's nothing but the present moment. There's no past. Mm -hmm. There's no future. It's the now, the now, the now. And that's being out in nature and in your garden or growing in a group of herbs, whatever it is that you choose to do, you're very present with those plants because you're, there's nothing in your universe right then except them and you. It's really, it's beautiful. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things our, our pets can teach us if we let them is, is presence mm -hmm. because that, that's how they live. Yeah. And yeah. now I'm actually taking the yard into another level. And so we're making medicines out of the herbs. I just made mulberry vinegar. <laughs> it was really cool. And I've made elderberry vinegar. And these are all from the different fruits growing on the property. So it's really cool. And my one of my best friends, she's an herbalist. And so her and I geek out on the weekends and you know, we're out there gardening and we're buying new plants. <laughs> Don't know where we're going to put them, but we keep buying them. And and we just love watching everything flourish and grow. And, uh, and it's, I don't know, there's just such something so joyful about that. Um, it's the same joy I feel when I'm working with my pets. It's the same kind of joy. So maybe that's what my secret to happiness is. Do what you love to do. And you don't have to be stuck doing one thing. <laughs> I had a lady once, you know, because years ago I, I've been growing food forever. And uh, she said to me, well, I don't, I don't think you should keep practicing veterinary medicine. I think you should go into gardening or something. And I said, well, why? She goes, well, because you love it so much. She goes, well, can't you love more than one thing? You know, like, I think we're too myopic. I think we need to yeah. fill our lives with things that bring joy and happiness. And so that's, there's a lot of things I love doing and I do them because I love them. Yay. <laughs> Um, so I, and I actually just downloaded one of your, your, your freebies. So I know you've got a lot for pet parents that they can, um, kind of pick and choose and see what resonates with them. And you've got a lot, a lot of stuff for them from your social media to your website. So where can people find you and, and start 
looking through all these wonderful assets. The hub of everything is dr and then my name.com. So drmarlenesiegel.com and you'll have the spelling there. So yeah, that's the easiest because from there you can go everywhere. And our store, I'm not sure when we're going to air this, but uh, should be within the next two weeks. We have another massive line of products that are going to, that are being added to our store from ozone to hyperbarics to laser to um, cold pressed seed oils. So many products are being added to the website now to the store. Oh, awesome. Yeah. It'll, it, that should be up before, before the episode airs. So um, all of that will be linked in the show notes. And I do highly recommend you check it out, regardless of like where you are, what level you're at, because there's so much information. You never know what you're going to come across that's going to like strike something in your brain. Or even I tell people all the time, like you can see something, read something, and it not resonate with you right then. But a year later, you come across something else and you're like, oh yeah, I, I heard about that or I read about that somewhere, you know, a year ago and um, yeah. it all adds up, it all builds. And I just want to say thank you um, so much for being so free and open with all of this information, helping pet parents. Um, and I know there's there's courses that they can take with you as well, which I'm sure are absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, so please... I can, yeah. I sure to... can I add one thing? It's it just yeah. really, really on my heart. So there's this thing called analysis paralysis. It's where you learn so much information, but you don't know where to start. So you don't start anywhere. And my particular philosophy is one where I want to hold your hand while we walk through the process. So we have you take the course, which gives you your foundation. And then we help you to implement a lifestyle because it is a lifestyle. It's not something you're going to do once in a while or for two weeks. We are changing your life and, and it doesn't have to be overwhelming. We do it one step at a time and we're really good at that. So I have solutions. You don't have to buy our solutions, but I make it to where if you're willing to reach your hand out, we'll hold it on the other side and help you to take these steps and stay in a positive attitude and do it till you're comfortable. And then you add the next thing and do that till you're comfortable. And before long, you're going to make massive improvements to your health, your pet's health and mother earth. There's so much value in that. And because they're exactly what you said, there is so much information out there and people get so confused. Get lost in the um, Yes, absolutely. So there's so much value in that. I'm glad you, you mentioned that because I think there certainly are people that need to hear something like that to pull the trigger mm -hmm. and um, can absolutely, like you said, change, change your life for the better. Yeah. Um, I think, I think so many of us are in need of that right now. So thank you very much. You're very <laughs> welcome. All right, guys, don't forget dr for dr dr marlene siegel.com and you'll be able to find everything there and link to everything all of her social medias it is all linked in the show notes and i am so so thrilled that you hung out with us today and i can't wait to talk to you next week thank you so much dr siegel you're very welcome and thank you for doing what you do because if it wasn't for people like you a lot of these pet parents would not have the information that they need. Thank you.